In the 1830s, the French political theorist Alexis de Tocqueville came to my country, America, and he traveled all around the country and he wrote a book because of what he learned called Democracy in America. And it was a book that taught the world a lot about what he thought was the special character of America. And he also thought that America in her democracy had a kind of example to set for the world at that time. And it's a book that's influenced generations of political thinkers. For my part, earlier this year, I came to Cuba for the first time. As an American visiting, I hope in the spirit of Alexis de Tocqueville, with an open mind and an open heart and a real desire to learn. And I traveled all across the country. I traveled from Havana to Vinales to Trinidad to Cienfuego to Matanza, Santa Clara. Everywhere I went, I tried to meet people and learn about the character of this country. In the end, the very special character of what it means to be Cuba and what it means to be a Cuban living here. And I met farmers and fishermen, and I met workers, and I met school teachers and doctors. And of course, what I wanted to learn was more about a place that I had heard so much about, but yet knew so very little. And so I want to offer some of my observations today in this new moment in the 21st century about what I learned in that same spirit of sharing kind of naive first impressions in modesty and also with gratitude to the many Cubans who shared so many of their thoughts and stories with me. It goes without saying that for a very long time, Cuba stood in the middle of two great superpowers as a kind of a bulwark that each had against the other. And in many ways, I think those superpowers saw Cuba as a pawn in a grand game of international relations. And yet Cuba was defining herself always on her terms. And in a very interesting way, that made her a kind of a symbol, a bastion of resistance in the world. And I think there is a new moment afoot where with the Cold War behind us, Cuba has an opportunity that you can feel in the air. It's happening here today, I think. Cuba has an opportunity to redefine herself in this new modern era, once again, on her own terms. But I think the big question, as I spoke to people, will, it turns out to be, what will those terms be? Well, I am a filmmaker and I make political documentaries, and very often I make them about my own country with what we call tough love in America. It means love, but with, critical, with a critical eye, with a critical appreciation, because Everywhere I went in Cuba, Cubans told me how much they love the American people, how much they really feel close to the American people, and I love the American people. But as a filmmaker and as a political thinker, I also am aware that my country, as a country, as a government, has conducted herself for decades in a way that has left our motivations open to question. It has not been exemplary. It has been that there is a kind of disconnect between the values of the American people, the values on which the country was founded, and the conduct of our international affairs all around the world, and very often the conduct of our affairs at home. One statistic, perhaps, may explain to you what is going sort of at the heart of what's ailing America today, what is causing us pain. The 400 richest people in America today have more money than the bottom 150 million people. 400 people with more money than 150 million people. I do not believe you can have a democracy in that condition. And in fact, Princeton University just a week ago published a study saying that the United States is in fact no longer a democracy. And as you see across American life, this kind of pain of that sort of wealth distribution and that kind of distribution of unequal power is having a devastating impact on so many walks of life where people find life difficult to afford and unfair and without health insurance and without proper education and other social services. But across the divide of the Cold War, it's no better in the former Soviet Union, which is a country now Russia also living out a broken promise to her people. And so with that Cold War behind us, we now see the two major superpowers facing a very uncertain future. And so the question returns, what is the future of this place? What is the future of Cuba in the wake of that grand game? And here it became fascinating, I would say, because as I went around the country, of course I know what Cuba's critics say of her. And I am a human rights advocate, so many of those concerns are concerns I will share. The question of the oppression of democratic freedoms, voting and whatnot. The question of the oppression of free expression. This is, of course, a human rights concern for anyone like myself who makes it their life's focus. And also, of course, there are other issues that relate to being a military dictatorship and the concerns that arise around that. And all of that has truth in it. 
But at the same time, that isn't the story that the Cuban people I met along the roads and in towns across this country told me. What Cuban people shared with me was their inordinate pride. Of course, they would tell me they wished they had more money, and they wished they had greater access to products and services. They wished they had greater access to the kind of information superhighway of the world, and they wish that it was more easy for them to get that kind of access. Of course, they are human beings who want goals and aspirations and dreams. But at the same time, they shared their extraordinary pride with me at what it means to be Cuba. They know, for example, with great pride about Cuba's remarkable education system, where 99% literacy rate prevails, unheard of in other countries in the world, and at the same time, a 99% high school graduation rate to be compared with America with only an 80% high school graduation rate, a remarkable statistic to boast for here in Cuba. And you can see it in the faces of school children, the pride and confidence they have as I visited schoolrooms and saw the way in which the young people are learning. And you move then to the healthcare system, the healthcare system where we recently saw Cuban doctors leading the charge in the fight to resolve the problem of Ebola. And so there you have Cuba leading the way, but that's abroad here at home. You have an extraordinarily low infant mortality rate and an extremely high life expectancy, far greater than many other countries in Latin America and in the Western world. And I myself had an emergency in the past week while I was here in Cuba. Thankfully, everybody is okay. But I got a firsthand experience inside the Cuban medical system, and it was everything it had been promised to be a remarkable system, a robust reflection of a powerful social safety net. And so it is perhaps no wonder that there is much to be proud of here that Cuban people shared with me everywhere I went. Cuba literally has a program of teaching young people environmentalism in the schools. In America, we can't even get the Democrats and Republicans to agree that we have global warming. Here you have an extraordinary set of developments on the environmental front, including 22% of the country protected environmentally. And so it is no wonder that Cuba finds herself in the news and the eyes of the world are on Cuba. Every time she makes a move, the question is, where is she going next? Is she, for example, going to become more capitalist? That I hear on the streets of Havana every day because you see new businesses. You see the government loosening a little bit its perspective on private enterprise. You see that certain kinds of self-employment are now allowed that weren't allowed before. And so a remarkable moment is, I think, happening all around us. And I notice that as I talk to people, their pride in that. And I think what it says is that Cuba now has an opportunity to face a kind of fork in the road. But it isn't enough to just say how exciting it is. You have to determine which direction you're going to go in. And here I think we have two paths that, that diverge. Down one path is sort of the best to be expected. And down the other is the worst that might be imagined. So for the moment, let's speak of the worst. The worst would be, for example, that I think Cuba would fly open its doors to unchecked capitalism, and it could end up, for example, with the kind of fate of a place like Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, which opened its doors wide to the same sort of capitalism that has ravaged the United States, and that has led to a dystopic reality for Puerto Rico, a very difficult life for its citizens, so many of whom are migrating away from their homeland. That is an outcome I would not want to see for Cuba. But down another road, there is a different example from the east, the country of Bhutan. Bhutan, for example, several decades ago had a monarch who decided that he wanted to open his society a little bit, but not just fly open the doors, do it carefully, mindfully. Try to balance what it means to be Bhutan with what it means to bring in outside influences, what products could be sold, what services could be offered, what outside influences could enter the country and appeal to his people. And he did that in a remarkable way that has made Bhutan a very glowing spot on the globe, a great interest to so many people. And that, I think, is perhaps an example that I see the Cuban government within reach of grasping. Because that is a remarkable example where Cuba could hang out a shingle that would say, new ideas welcome, new businesses welcome, but read the fine print because we will regulate you very carefully and we will make it that only the select boutique best businesses can come here. Those that are going to practice a green economy, which is the only future the world can su survive. Those that are going to practice good social practices in labor, other elements of a, of a 21st century 
way of doing business. And I think if Cuba hung out such a shingle, it would be balancing between those new ideas and those new companies and their contributions and all the beauty that that can bring with what it means to have built such a robust safety net and what such a robust social state that does not want to lose its way and sort of give up what so many Cubans fought so hard to preserve. And there I think there is an opportunity for the Cuban leadership to have a kind of last laugh. At the end of a Cold War that had such a standoff and those two superpowers are now finding themselves a bit lost in their own destinies, Cuba could say, here we are and we have readied ourselves with the hard work of our people to seize this new moment in human history and make the most of it and become a kind of Bhutan of the Western Hemisphere, a glowing spot on the globe. And I think if that happens, it will indeed be finally a kind of last laugh for the Cuban people themselves, who sacrifice to make this country a spot of a kind of resistance in the world, an extraordinarily poetic place in which to stage an experiment in what it means to be a country in the 21st century leading the good fight.